we go. Great. Well, thank you all so much for joining us for the power of personal history, turning tragedies into triumph from the Congo Civil War to a UMass PhD. Uh, so author uh, Mazash uh, Bungo uh, will discuss his powerful new memoir, The Aforementioned Power of Personal History. Uh, Mazash uh, will detail his extraordinary journey as a young man surviving a civil war, living in the forests in, uh, of the Republic of the Congo for over a year, becoming a Fulbright Scholar at Brandeis University, and recently attaining a PhD from UMass Lowell. Born to a mother who never finished high school, but emphasized to him the power of personal history and education, um, uh, Mazash uh, learned English at a, as a young adult by listening to a broadcast called The Voice of America. Uh, he will share his unique story about personal tragedies and how tragedy can live within us and create an inward drive and tenacity, but also of how higher education and a new language can also uh, can allow someone to see their life through a different perspective and make positive change and growth. Uh, Mazash delivered the student commencement speech at UMass Lowell graduation ceremony this past spring and the research for his dissertation documents, uh, the stories of immigrants who experienced civil war and or genocide and use these experiences to fuel their entrepreneurial drive and business creation in America. And his story uh, over the summer was uh, featured in the Lowell Sun. Uh, so again, want to thank the uh, partnering libraries and the Friends of the Tewksbury Public Library and all, uh, let's see, 30 of us or so. Let's give a big virtual round of applause to Mazash for joining us here this evening. And Mazash, it is an absolute pleasure, absolute pleasure. I, I finished your book. Uh, so folks, the uh, this book available at uh, uh, certainly uh, local libraries and uh, certainly on Amazon, and I'm sure you can get them through independent bookstores. But I finished Masasha's book um, this this afternoon, and it's quite a powerful story. So Masasha, I thought we would get right into it. And the first few chapters of your book, uh, the first two chapters of your book, uh, you talk about uh, growing up uh, in the Congo uh, during the Civil War. And I'm wondering if you could talk about um, uh, th that experience. Yeah, sure. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you so much, you know, for having me for hosting this uh, uh, book uh, talk event. It's uh, it is such an uh, such a privilege, and I am very fortunate to be here. Um, so, um, with respect to your question, the whole book is about the power of a personal history. Um, so, um, when I was about to twelve years old. Um, civil war ravaged my town. Um, it, it's, it's a small town called Dolizzi. Uh, and um, I, I left with my youngest brother, uh, my mother, um, heading for my grandfather's village. Um, we uh, walked uh, for about three weeks uh, through the you know, savannas and you know, forests um we walked uh, longer distances and um sometimes we um we were just uh, desperate uh we walked uh, um silently you know sadly um and and sometimes with you know faith in in a life a faith in in a new like a promised land which was my grandfather's village and um soon after we we uh, got to, to my grandfather's village. Um, we felt uh, relieved uh, because we believed that the, the village was our uh, safe uh, heaven, okay? Um, uh, but, uh, you know, a couple of months later, um, they, you know, the, the village uh, became nothing, um, a place uh, filled with uh, pain and loss when, okay, one morning those who were supposed to protect us invaded the village when the tanks um, burned houses and looted goods. And, and then we were uh, forced to, to flee and live in, you know, the forest for over a year um, in the, uh, the huts uh, made of uh, palm leaves and branches and without, you know, any decent food. And sometimes without any um, you know, salt. Um, 
And, and, and the, the reason why I kind of started my, my, my book with um, these, uh, this story is because I came to kind of understand that history is not the past. History is, um, is not the past. Uh, history actively lives within uh, each of us. History uh, invokes um, uh, inspirations that shape our present and future of the conditions. And, um, and also I believe that each of us has, uh, has a history of pain uh, that uh, uh, defines uh, who we are, uh, influences how our behaviors and attitudes, and it definitely gives us um, the, the tenacity to create a sustainable like, value in you know, the, the world that we live in. However, what also I do believe that is that when we are aware of how our uh, past of pain or how our you know, personal like, history, uh, we find out two things for ourselves. One is that we, um, know what to avoid doing. And second, we uh, develop uh, the inner water drive and the tenacity to carry out what we do. So, um, you know, as I was reflecting on, on, on my history, I believe that um, these are two key points uh, that I have just mentioned uh, are those that have uh, made me uh, you know, be um, rich, okay, where I am, okay, today. Um, so um, that's what I, I can say, you know, for, for the two, you know, basic, you know, chapters um, that, you know, history is not, is not a past. It's, uh, it's, it's who we are in, in many respects. And, and sometimes we um, uh, believe that the, uh, the past of the pain is, um, is, is the past. Um, but it's, it's all about the importance of uh, the, the, the past of the pain and the purpose of it. Um, yeah, so I, that's what I think I can, I can say so far, yeah. Yeah, no, that's great. You, you, you answered a question I didn't even answer, but mm. I'll tell you, there are so many amazing inspirational quotes, mm. whether there are things you're saying or things people are saying to you, like your family members or some of your teachers or mentors, or, you know, you, you have some great quotes from JFK and Nelson Mandela. And I'll say there's so many great quotes throughout your book. And um, we'll, we'll delve into some of them uh, in a few moments. Um, so I, I was wondering if you could talk about the importance of uh, education. I know that um, uh, you, uh, so the war ended in December 20, uh, it, it was December 2000, I think it was. School started for you a few months later. One teacher for the entire village, yeah. uh, and the the families paid the teacher directly. There was the the government didn't pay the teacher. That's wild. Yeah, uh, but but can you talk about the um, some of the sacrifices that you had to make, and really the importance that your parents instilled um, uh, when it comes to ed education? Uh, of course, uh, two things that I want to mention, uh, and, and briefly, you know, before I kind of uh, dive into your question. One is that uh, even until today, there are some uh, villages in, you know, the public of the Congo, where you find there is just one teacher, okay? Um, and, uh, and two, there are some, you know, and children who um, do not go to school, uh, not because you know they cannot, but because they do not have opportunities, you know, to go to school. Uh, so what in my you know experience um, you know tells is, is that education is is uh, is a powerful tool. Okay, is um, is is a, a process of through which uh, someone can empower. Okay, it's you know himself or herself. Um, so now, with respect to your question, yes, um, after after the civil war, I think um, a, a year after, uh, just we we came out of you know the um, uh, the forest. Um, it was in two thousand, so we had one teacher for the entire you know village. 
And um, and then uh, you know, on the a couple of days before my uh, my my exam uh, day, uh, my mom uh, you know fell sick. Uh, she was terribly okay, sick. Um, and then um, and then on on my um, exam day. I, I had to take uh, my exam, you know, um, uh, my exam. Um, and the, so here is the problem. Um, my, my dad uh, had uh, just five dollars, okay? And either he had to spend uh, that five dollars for my uh, exam fees or, uh, you know, for my uh, mother's uh, medical treatment. And as you can imagine, um, uh, the, you know, the, um, uh, the choice was uh, clear. So you had to, to spend, uh, you know, $5, you know, on my uh, mother's medical treatment. And I recall that day when, uh, you know, my, my, my father called me and, and told me that, um, uh, listen, son. I know that you have worked so so hard for you know um, um, for your school, uh, but I I am afraid that you will take your exam, and 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 because of this you know situation, your mom is sick, but also I don't have money. I have just five dollars, um, and and the, the the same day that they were leaving, okay, my my um, um, my my late grand uh, mother's village to go to another village for you know um, my mom to get the uh, the medical treatment was the same day that my classmates were leaving the same village to go to another village to take the exam um so i was standing in front of our house um seeing my parents going to another village and at the same time my classmates going to another village to take the exam um so i felt like I, I was missing a lifetime opportunity. I felt like uh, the world um, inspired against me. I felt like um, I could not um, be someone. I could not become someone. So it, it was a very uh, difficult uh, moment. Um, and because um, you know, I felt really, uh, there, there was a heavy uh, emotional pain okay, in me. Um, and then, um, I, you know, in the evening on the same day when my, my, my parents came back, you know, from another village where my, my, when my, where my mom uh, got a treatment and my classmates also and to get back, you know, got back to, to the village. And uh, all the village and was uh, happy because all of my classmates um, succeeded in the exam. And I was the only one who did not succeed. I was the only one who did not take uh, the exam. And um, and I recall one of my uh, my classmates at the time came to um, uh, to see me. You know, uh, at my uh, you know parents' okay, place. I tried to kind of comfort me, and but I did not want to talk to him. Uh, it was a little bit um, aside, um, and uh, you know, until my mom told me, you know, go and talk to to your friend. He has come to, uh, you know, to talk to you, and uh, you know, spend some some time with uh, you know with uh, uh, with him. Um, so I went and we talked a little bit, um, and and then he um, he left. Um, um, but you know, it it was a difficult time, and um, and there are quite a lot of lessons that I I, I drew from that experience. You know victory always and brings you know people together uh, but in the moment of desperation in the moment of a failure in the moment of uh, quote in quote despair uh, usually you share it with yourself or you share it with um, your your very close friends or you know your very close family um, so that's what I you know one of the things that I learned from that experience and um, but also and as I mentioned, uh, the, the the power of education is um, is beyond what we imagine it is beyond what we can grasp it. Um, education is not just uh, the schools. The education is not just 
uh, the institutions, um, education, and as I mentioned, is uh, is the way that someone can understand um, his purpose in this world, how he can fulfill, of course, his mission in this world, is uh, um, the, the way that someone can uh, empower okay, himself or herself. Um, so that's uh, what has um, uh, has been, you know, my my life. I can say, if I am here today, is because of, uh, you know, education and that uh, um, isolated uh, event of my life, uh, and of course has uh, defined uh, a lot of aspects, okay, of my life. And uh, hand in hand with education uh, was uh, your desire and ability to learn English. And in chapter five, you talk about that. Uh, why don't you reveal to us how you uh, how you learned English? Yes, uh, you know, my, my, my mother uh, um, uh, did not finish high school, um, but she emphasized to me the power of education because she knew that education could change the course of my life, uh, you know, as a person and, of course, as a citizen of the world. And um, when I was about to go to college, uh, it was when I got my um, 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 my exam, you know, from you know high school to uh, to college. So uh, my mom told me that uh, actually my parents, you know, my mom and my father, okay, told me that I don't know how 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 they they, they kind of understood. Um, that English could be something good for me, but they, you know, they told me, um, son, we would like you to learn English, uh, you know, just for yourself. Um, and then I went to college um, in another town, uh, another regional department. Um, I, I met a teacher who was teaching uh, English and actually the teacher could not come on regular basis okay, to school. Uh, and then I just, uh, you know, fell in love with the English, and I asked him uh, if he could and um, to bring me a uh, a dictionary and so that I could learn English. Uh, so what he did, and, uh, and and he said, "Oh, okay, I will see what I can I can do for you." So the next time we had a class, the, this teacher brought me a, a dictionary, and actually the dictionary um, was. Um, like a half burned, okay. It wasn't that kind of a full, you know, uh, dictionary uh, with all the pages. It it was a half burned, and and then he and he told me that uh, um, if of course you wanted to learn English, you can turn on uh, the broadcast called like a Voice of America. And at that time, I had a small radio. I don't I don't think it does exist, okay. Uh, uh, again, it was a kind of a small radio. Uh, so and uh, I could wait on the weekends uh, to turn that program about English, you know, the English grammar, uh, English conversations, um, and of course, um, you know, they, they, they had, uh, in addition to that, they had also programs that helped people, um, you know, to uh, improve their listening skills. Uh, so that's how I, you know, came to learn English and I self-taught, I taught myself English at the time. Uh, and, and then when I left college, I wanted to um, um, uh, to the university to do my, my bachelor's degree in Brazzaville. Uh, and that's where I kind of, uh, of course, uh, improved my, my, my English uh, much better because uh, in Brazzaville, which is uh, the, the, the main city okay, of the public of the Congo, the capital of the public of the Congo, uh, they, there is, um, uh, a U.S. embassy, and um, and and actually, they they also have um, a cultural center. Um, so that they called, um, I think, at that time, Villa Washington. So sometimes they could invite guest speakers to come and talk uh, about a different, you know, topics, uh, but in English. So that's where I, I, you know, I improved my English, and I came to learn that there was an opportunity uh, called, you know, Fulbright uh, Fellowship, and they um, they had different criteria to get the Fulbright Fellowship. First, you have to get uh, a bachelor's degree, and second, you have to to speak English, and of course, take a TOEFL exams, which is an exam for uh, non-English speaking uh, people. Um, and uh, and that's where I I said to myself, listen, I, the civil war has kind of made my family, um, quote unquote, uh, 
destitute, okay, in terms of financial means. And if I really wanted to and further my education in you know, overseas, this is the only opportunity that I do have. And this opportunity is based on merits. There is no um, something uh, such as you know, corruption or favoritism uh, when they respect it to your ethnic, okay, your background or whatever. Um, so uh, yes, it was a lifetime opportunity. And uh, for the first time that I did apply for Fulbright Fellowship, I, I, I failed. And, um, and the second time I came and uh, I got a Fulbright, uh, you know, fellowship and, uh, and, and it was uh, one of the blessings, okay, of my life. All right, so uh, that brings us to, um, well, first of all, I, I want to read some quotes to you. Um, just really incredible stuff. Um, to have the extra drive to succeed, to overcome life's barriers, you must have the sense of family history. You must know that your ancestors, you must know what your ancestors have been through. Uh, and then you also wrote, uh, my inward drive, desire, and grit to succeed for better days were and will be the only wealth I inherited from my family, from my parents and my ancestors. I thought that my ancestral resilience would be within me and be my guidance. And then uh, I did want to talk about faith. Uh, your mom had a great quote. Your mom and your dad had great quotes throughout the book. Your mom says, uh, if we lose faith, we cannot afford the price of loss and suffering. Uh, how, uh, can you talk a little bit about the importance of uh, faith throughout your journey? Uh, yes, I, I believe that faith is, is not something just um, intangible, is, um, is it something that we put um, in motion. And um, when the respect to that quote, um, it was when we were fleeing a civil war and uh, the next couple of weeks, we uh, found ourselves in this giant uh, forest. When I say we, my mother, my youngest brother uh, and me, and then since that day, we walked long distances without, you know, any rest. Um, and then my, my feet um, started swelling, okay, or, and got to swollen. And, and then there was a liquid coming out of my feet. Uh, it was very painful. Uh, so, my mom asked me to rest, um, uh, you know, for a while, uh, so that my feet could somehow cool down a little bit. Um, and and then when she asked me again, so after we uh, rested for a couple of minutes, and then she said, uh, "But listen, we we have to uh, to walk again," and I could not walk. I, I was um, so in a pain, uh, my feet were in a pain. Um, and then I told her that, uh, listen, I cannot walk. I, and then she looked at me and she told me that actually we have to walk. She told me that look at the sky. The sun is about to set down, which means that the night is a coming soon. And you and I cannot stay here in this huge forest. No one will come to save us. No one will come to rescue us. No matter how painful you have, we have to walk we have to find another village to where we can sleep, to where your feet can be taken care of. Mm -hmm. And then she told me that God listens to those who have firm faith to act and do act. And she added to that, uh, carry carry your load to your destination 
and we need to find our destination. So, um, you know, faith is all what um, I can say makes us, uh, and 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 then it has been a part of my life. Uh, a, a, a huge part of my life. And I told myself, if you can survive such an event, what else you cannot survive in a life? What else uh, can break you down? And, um, you know, faith is, is where you are being tested by life circumstances. Okay, uh, and uh, and and then when um, an such uh, event, such a crisis happens, uh, two things can happen to us. One, we can freeze and not be able to seek out any other opportunity for growth. We can become immune to suffering and not to be able to thrive. Or we can say, yes, it has happened, but I can, I can make it. And that requires a lot of uh, faith. It requires a lot of inward drive and tenacity. Excellent, absolutely. Um, so, uh, so you, so we'll keep going forward chronologically here. So you uh, receive the uh, Fulbright scholarship. You're on your way. I think you're given like a few days notice. They arrange a flight into JFK for you. Uh, so you're coming to America for the first time. You're going to, is it uh, Ohio University? They give you $200 in your pocket and a winter coat. Uh, you, you arrive in New York. Delta loses your luggage, which is such a Delta thing, yeah. And uh, and then the school doesn't send anyone for, to pick you up and it's snowing. It's the first time or one of the first times you're ever seeing snow. Um, so can you talk about the interaction you have with the cab driver, with, who I think kind of had a profound effect on you? Uh, yes. Um... As you mentioned, and actually the school sent someone to pick me up at the airport, uh, but uh, she did not show up, and I don't know for some reasons. Uh, so uh, somehow a, a Delta, um, uh, how do you call, how do you call, uh, you call her, a Delta agent, you know, something like that, you know, helped me like find uh, a cab. And then when I, you know, found a cab, this guy was from, uh, uh, Somalia. So he has been living like, in the U.S. for years. Uh, so he kind of wondered okay, where I was coming from. And I told her, uh, him actually, that I was coming from the Republic of the Congo. And um, and then he, um, you know, he wanted to, uh, went on to tell me and uh, about uh, what America is, uh, the American dream, and what it means to uh, you know, people like me, you know, coming from Africa or African nationals. And, um, and then he also told me his own story that he fled um, civil war that happened in Somalia in 1991. And um, his whole family okay, was murdered. Uh, so he was able to come here with um, his wife and his two daughters. So he, uh, before that, he lived in uh, in Kenya um, in you know refugee camp, um, and and then he kind of uh, the, the picture that he was giving me about America was um, uh, contradictory. Both it was dark and both it was um, promising. Dark um, in the sense that he. Um, you know, said to me that uh, American dream was not for people like me. So whatever that I could do, but I could not live American dreams. And um, and then and in promising, and two, uh, because he told me that I was young, he could see my uh, youthfulness, my, you know, energy, um, and of course my ambition and, uh, 
you taught me uh, and of course uh, do not forget where you come from uh, and and it's a kind of a link to what i have uh, you know, one of the quotes that you have mentioned about uh, you cannot succeed in life and unless you know what your parents went through. It's all about, you know, history. It's all about where we are coming from. And maybe by extension, I can say, uh, you know, one of the defining uh, moments in America uh, to me is uh, in 1775 when Henry Patrick and gave this you know famous speech, give me liberty or give me death. And you can see that a single event defined what America is today. So it's all about history. Um, so I, that's what you know, I had as an encounter with this man um, and he was very generous to me at the end. And he said, you know, keep your eyes on the God, okay? Uh, you, you, no matter what you see, no matter what and people will tell you, uh, do not forget where, where you are coming from and keep your eyes on the gods. Yeah. Uh, so you're, you're, you're doing well academically, but you're feeling alone and lonely and homesick. A uh, great quote you had, um, I had to make my adversity work for me, never against me, even when I was a stranger in a new land. Uh, mm -hmm. And you also uh, later said in that chapter nine, I understand that I had come from the ashes and I never wanted to abandon faith and courage to live, dream big, and to continue the march towards my own emancipation. Uh, you were getting more involved in the campus. You were going to uh, speeches. Uh, you attended meetings of the Black Student Union, uh, which you had an inter you had an interesting interaction there. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't. I think we'll skip that for the uh, purposes of time. Uh, I was curious. In, in chapter ten, you talk about how you gave. Um, a presentation to one of your classes about um, um, one of the richest uh, native uh, people of Africa and uh, African born, you know, uh, rich, rich, uh, you know, a wealthy person. And your classmates were surprised to learn that there were wealthy people in Africa. And you kind of lamented the mainstream media and the way that it portrays Africa. You know, it only shows civil wars, corruption, suffering, misery, famine, and an occasional safari. Uh, can you talk briefly about the way that the US mainstream media portrays Africa and, and maybe how it could do a better job? Yes, I think it's not just the the the, um, uh, the U.S. per se. You know, it's it's a lot of uh, mainstream media. It, you know, it comes from uh, Europe here and and there. And um, uh, to me, that event was a kind of a cultural shock for me because uh, before coming to America, we you know personally, I had um, another idea of America. I thought that America looked Africa through the lens that we uh, looked up. You know, look. Uh, look at America. Um, okay, which is we um, like you know that it's it's a di it's it's a diverse you know country. You know it's 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 they they had uh, prosperity and, and etc. So for me, um, you know that event was a, a big cultural shock. I I, I did not know uh, that Africa Africa was being uh, looked through the lens. Um, of a cliche of 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 civil wars of uh, like a famine of poverty of lack of you know education of people who aren't unable to to create like until I had that you know assignment in my class where my teacher uh, asked us to to present about a self-made like a millionaire and 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 then the reason why I presented about Aliko Dangote uh, which is the richest man uh, the richest uh, man in um, um, uh, in Africa uh, was because I saw my classmates uh, presenting about um, okay, other okay, self-made okay, millionaires, and for example, uh, Mark, you know, Mark Zuckerberg, uh, Bill Gates, uh, uh, Jack Ma, uh, and the list goes on. So I was a kind of a forced, uh, you know, to to talk about um, to talk about Africa for that uh, for that lens, and uh, it was kind of it was interesting. And even until today, 
I think uh, things are, are changing a little bit the way that uh, the mainstream media is portraying Africa, uh, but still those those cliche like, are still there. Okay, the cliche of believing that you know people from Africa are poor. You know this is only what is happening in Africa. You know uh, corruption, poverty, and etc. Um, I, I can say to some extent they may be right. Those are things are real. Okay, we we have had civil wars, we uh, um, we go through some difficult times, you know, corruption and etc. Uh, but uh, those those are things are not the uh, the only ones that define Africa. There they, they, they are a lot of um, like uh, things that that are happening, you know, in Africa that you know the mainstream media is not kind of you know talking about. But also, it's not just about mainstream media. It's also about um, self education, how people educate themselves um, about the rest of the world, uh, what they know about Africa, what they know about the Middle East, what they know about Europe. Um, but you know that's what it is, uh, and uh, it was a, a very interesting encounter for me, a very interesting like a cultural shock. Uh, so you uh, complete your studies at uh, Ohio uh, State. You uh, move on to Brandeis here in Massachusetts, and um, well, before we get there, let me read a couple more quotes. I'm going to read quotes that reinforce the message of your book, right? So your sort of your mother figure there, Veronica, uh, when you visit her in, in Atlanta, uh, she has a great quote. Uh, it's especially important to keep the family history alive. Family history is like a compass. It reminds us of where we have come from, the sacrifices that those who preceded uh, us made, and the adversities they endured, and the responsibility that we have to do better and excel. And then your friend Jeremy wrote uh, or said, um, always try to make history relevant to you, which I thought was a nice quote. And then another quote from Plymouth Plantation of all places where you went on a field trip uh, when you were at Brandeis. Uh, it is extremely important to learn about your family history. By learning about them, you also learn about where you were coming from. And then a quote that you actually gave 20 minutes ago, uh, talking about history was primarily an existential biography. It was about two primary basics, the knowledge about the past and the vision of the future, which I think you alluded to. Uh, but I'm going to let you explain the next quote, because I think you say it about 12 times during the book. Uh, what, who, who's France, uh, France Fanon? And can you, can you tell us a bit about uh, the quotation that uh, you use um, quite a bit? Ah uh, yes, uh, Francis Fernan was um, um, was an African. Uh, he was um, a psychologist uh, and a surgeon as well. He was also um, uh, he was in uh, uh, in the military. Uh, he he fought against uh, you know French invasion in Algeria. Uh, he was an author. Um, so uh, the, his quote is, uh, I, I think, came from um, what um, I think what must black skin. Uh, so in which he and kind of uh, mentioned that each gen each generation out of uh, uh, relative opacity must uh, discover its mission either. To fulfill it or betray it. So, which means that, as you know, uh, we talked about a family. Um, uh, each generation in each family has has a something to do to advance, uh, um, you know, family history. Uh, to advance a family, I can say, you know, wealth. Um, so it's it's. Um, it's, it's the responsibility that the next generation has to take. And for the next generation to take that responsibility, they have to be aware of the past. They have to be aware of what has happened okay, in the past. They have to be aware of what the, ancestor, um, uh, the ancestors uh, um, did in the past to make sure that they have the opportunities that they do have today, and how, of course, they can uh, pass uh, the torch okay, to the next, uh, um, you know, uh, youth, uh, etc. Um, so it's 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 all about the the, the responsibility that each generation okay has, and we can of course talk about it in the context of America, as I was you know talking about you know Patrick Henry uh, passed. 
uh, passed away uh, you know, so many years ago. Uh, but uh, today we have a new generation of, America, uh, of Americans who is uh, trying to make this country more creative, who's trying to make this country more inclusive, who's trying to make this country more innovative in many respects. Um, so um, it's all about uh, the, the the mission that we have to accomplish and uh and and then we cannot accomplish it if we are not uh, a way of it if we not if we do not come to understand that we have uh the, the that weight of um the the accomplishments of the the previous generations up on our shoulders so uh, you succeed at Brandeis, and while most college students uh, are drinking or partying or smoking, you establish the Brandeis University Fulbright chapter, and you spend uh, part of your time volunteering at homeless shelters and, uh, and, and, and um, food pantries and, and uh, soup kitchens. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the comments, one of the observations you make is, you know, uh, America is, you know, this, you know, wealthiest, most capitalistic uh, society uh, on the planet, and yet there's still so much poverty and hunger here. Uh, you want, want to uh, uh, touch on that a little bit? Yeah, sure. Uh, it was a cultural shock for me um, because, the, as I said, the image that we have back home of America is a, a prosperous country, is that everybody you know, has money, is that everybody has a home, is that everybody has a car. And for me, when I came, first of all, to see that they were homeless, that there were places that people could go and eat, it was something unbelievable to me. Um, and uh, you know that's what i came to you know to understand and uh, i think there is um i don't know what what i can say about it i think um when i say i don't know it's not because i kind of don't know but it's 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 uh, it was a cultural shock uh it's kind of to see we have uh, you know rich country and at the same time we have a people who do not have something to eat at the same time we have people who do not have a place to sleep and and then the more time i spent in america the more i came to understand why we have you know homeless why we have people who do not have you know a place to sleep uh but definitely it was uh, a big cultural shock for me so in chapter 18, when you're talking about your experience uh, at Grace Chapel in Lexington, um, I don't really want to talk about that. But what I want to talk about is you mentioned that you have a journal. And mm -hmm. throughout this entire book, I'm wondering to myself, how is he remembering everything that is happening to him? You know, I struggle to remember what I ate for lunch yesterday, you know, or what I wore to work on Monday. Um, so I'm curious, you know, uh, and this is sort of big picture, but like when you wrote this memoir, did you have uh, any sort of difficulty uh, remembering all these things? I mean, many of these things were very traumatizing, uh, you know, in, in, in your youth. Uh, how were you able to uh, accurately remember most of this stuff? Uh, I think it's quite difficult to say because maybe I have a, a different brain uh, and that's one and two of course I always keep uh, a journal uh, sometimes I just jot it down some um, you know and the core ideas what I hear and, and then later on I try to remember everything that has happened uh, so for example when I was writing the, the first couple of chapters of my book which talked uh, mostly about the civil war uh there were certain scenes that i could not remember and uh what i did not not cut i could not remember but certain names of certain places that we stayed like with my like a mother and a youngest brother so sometimes i you know i i called my mom okay on the phone to ask her to remind me the names of these places and it was a shock for her to see me or to hear me ask her the names of these scenes because um during the civil war after the civil war until today my family never never talks about the civil war what happened even today, I don't know what was my mother's experience with respect to uh, the civil war. How did she feel about it? Um, so, uh, 
yes, so I, I called my mom, you know, ask her about uh, these, uh, uh, the names of these places. Um, yes, it's, it's just the, the way that, you know, I think um, human brain is, uh, is, is uh, miraculous, I can say. It, it works in the way that we may not imagine how it can work. Uh, so for me, it was, um, uh, I, I have a different type of a brain. I think I, I, I remember a lot and uh, I, and of course I always keep a journal. Yeah. Uh, so folks, if you have any questions or comments, uh, feel free to start getting them into the chat and the Q&A. Uh, I certainly have more questions, but I, I do want to definitely ask uh, questions from the audience. So feel free to start putting those in. And um, Okay, so um, we've we've graduated from Brandeis. Now we're looking to get our PhD. Uh, initially, uh, we run into some issues. You apply to ten schools. Eight of them reject you. One of them, I don't know, delays their pro admissions process for a year. And then you do get accepted to one, but um, they don't offer you a scholarship or financial aid or whatnot. Um, so so it's really not realistic. So then, like. You you know you have to go back to the Congo. So mm -hmm. so what 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 was your thought process there going home and uh, sort of what uh, what did you plan to do there? Oh, uh, first of all, I was a little bit disappointed because I wanted to do my PhD right away after my master's degree, and second of all, I was excited to see that how much um, uh, uh, how much I I, I grew. Okay. Uh, you know, in in um, um, in America, how much I I, I learned, uh, and and then I was excited to go back home, excited to put uh, into practice what I have learned, okay, in America. And uh, one of the things that I did was to establish a social enterprise, like working with the youth and served youth in the areas of. Um, leadership, entrepreneurship, and uh, critical thinking skills. Uh, but also, there was a kind of a cultural shock for me, a reverse cultural shock, okay, by the way, uh, when I went back home, because um, not quite much has changed, you know, after I left, you know, home. And then I could hear, you know, and, and uh, I could hear people asking me why I have like okay, come back home, why I did not stay in America. Um, and, um, but it was, it was interesting. And I believe that uh, as, um, you know, um, Marcel Proust, um, Marcel okay, Proust was uh, a French uh, author said, uh, the, the real war, the, the real um, purpose of, uh, uh, um, uh, of a voyage is not to find new land, but is to find new eyes. And I think that America, coming to America has given me new eyes. And when I went back home, I had a new eyes, had a new mindset, how to turn things around. And uh, Mazas, when you, when you went back home, you were kind of a rock star, I feel like the the you were you were a role model to the students. You were teaching them English and the importance of education, and you uh, filmed the documentary, and you were a regular guest on a radio show. So I think you became kind of a pretty big deal. Um, but then your fortunes changed again. Um, uh, all of a sudden, you got notification that you were accepted to the uh, doctoral program at UMass Lowell, which is about 15 minutes from the Tewksbury Library. Um, and uh, you, at first, were a little hesitant. Uh, you weren't sure you were going to able to be able to afford it. Uh, but a friend uh, convinced you to do, I guess, a GoFundMe, and you were able to raise just uh, enough money. And you arrived in Lowell with $100 in your pocket. Mm -hmm. uh, and you had another interesting uh, cab driver. Um, and uh, I want to fast forward ahead, though. Uh, so you wind up um, uh, living um, in an apartment um, with a, a Vietnamese gentleman who's the, la the landlord. And I want you to talk a little bit about what you learned from him. Yes, he was. Uh... He was actually his nickname was Tony, uh, and he was a very kind and uh, landlord. Uh, and um, you know, actually today I keep in touch with him. Uh, so you told me how you came to America. Uh, you also fled, um, you know, Vietnamese like okay, war uh, at that time. 
So he came to America with nothing, um, but he was able to, uh, uh, to, to make a lot of money. He is, he is now, um, let me say, quote unquote, and a, a rich man because he, uh, he owns uh, um, a lot of properties here and there. Uh, so um, he kind of understood my background, though that he did not know that I survived your know, civil war, uh, but he, he was a very, like an open-minded guy and very helpful. I, I can say it would be um, it, it would be illogical for me to say that what I have become is because of myself. No, I think I have been fortunate enough uh, that people, some people in my life, um, have helped me and uh, helped me through the guidance. And uh, my landlord uh, was one of them. And, um, you know, his, his, uh, his story is just, uh, um, is, is, is just inspiring. Um, and, you know, we, I can relate to that, um, definitely. So, um, yes, so I, I, I think I, you know, as 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 we are talking, I'm getting a little bit emotional because uh, you know some of the things that you, you told me, uh, uh, you know, when you came to America, you did not have you know you know family here, you know, you did not have a place to stay. Sometimes you did not have um, you know food. You had to go to you know pantry. Being a refugee in in America. Uh, so it it uh, reminded me what I, I went through, uh, you know, not only after the civil war uh, that I went through with my family, but also the everlasting effects of the civil war. Because after the civil war, um, you know, I found my my family um, with the meager like a means, you know, financial means, and sometimes I could not know when my next meal will come. So it um, it was a um, um, it it was it was um, a tough moment and uh, and and that's I, I believe that the beauty okay the beauty of uh, uh, of life the beauty of life is of course to understand from my perspective uh, the importance of the past of a pain and the purpose of it uh, the moment we understand that I believe that we can do miraculous. Okay, things in the world. Yeah, I, that's just, I mean, it's such inspirational, uh, wonderful comments. Um, uh, you kind of leave us hanging at the end of the book. So you're struggling a little, you admit you're struggling a little bit with the with the PhD program. Um, you talk about, you have some, you have some really inspirational stuff. Um, uh, I thought of my long walk through the savannas and forests, of my running through the uh, long leaves when soldiers invaded my village, uh, of the defiant voice of the crying old woman, or my great aunt who refused to flee when the Civil War broke out in my town, which we didn't even touch on that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I know that your great aunt uh, went missing, was never found after the war. Um, mm -hmm. You talked about, uh, I, I went on to think of myself coming to a new land with little money in my pocket, the importance of committing to a generation that must uh, uh, betray or fulfill its mission of the inspirational stories of people like the cab driver from Somalia and the landlord from uh, Vietnam. Uh, I wanted to find my inner strength amid the adversity I was going through. I wanted to embrace the inward drive that kept pushing me to go to the next level, even when things looked bleak. And as I thought of all those crucial memories as precious gifts, I felt like I was refueled with faith to resist and persist. And um, so can you tell us, and I kind of spoiled it when I introduced you, didn't I? But uh, were you able to uh, attain that PhD from UMass Lowell? Uh, yes, I was able. I was able to uh, obtain the PhD. I finished. Um, and um, I, I think that um, the, the last couple of years of my PhD okay, were extremely difficult. Um, in the sense that I, my my scholarship was um, uh, was cut, I, I I did not have a scholarship anymore because of the COVID, and um, 
and and then I you know and also there are some there were some challenges within you know the the, the PhD program, but I had kind of a sense of uh, somehow an idea like crossed my mind to give up uh, to abandon uh, my PhD journey, uh, but um, I thought of what I went through, how I was able to not only survive, overcome, but also to thrive in what I went through. And that's where, um, as I mentioned in the beginning of our discussion, that's where uh, comes the inward drive and the tenacity to carry out what we do. And to have that inward drive, to have that tenacity, comes from the knowledge of history, the knowledge of the past of a pain. Because to me, it gives us what I call the center of gravity, without which we cannot do something, we cannot become successful. Um, so to me, that was, uh, or that is, even until today, uh, whenever I, I am facing difficulties, I always try to remember the where I am coming from. And uh, maybe in closing, I can say, uh, we are living in a very uh, difficult time. We are living in a time of a lot of uh, crises, a lot of uh, challenges. Okay, people are being let off. Uh, we see war here and there, um, but how do we find the drive to to push on the drive to uh, uh, to thrive to survive. It's one we will call a how on personal history. And quick question from Jean in the audience who writes: Great presentation, and uh, Mazas um, Mazas had the she wants to know what was the topic of your dissertation, and you had the perfect topic. What was that topic, Mazas? Uh, the topic was um, exploring the influence of conflict experience, experiences in uh, understanding the nexus of um, uh, personality trait, uh, traits, excuse me, entrepreneurship uh, and uh, storytelling. Uh, so it was the intersection between conflict experiences, the emergence of entrepreneurialism, and of course, of personality traits, how, how past give us a certain personality traits. Is we are resilient or not, yeah. Yeah, and that's right up your alley, clearly. Um, Michelle writes, thank you for this presentation. Your journey was inspiring and hopeful. James says, thanks to all who put on this presentation. Uh, Barb writes, thank you all so much, and we will get your book at a local independent bookstore this weekend. Uh, God bless you for your perseverance and strength to tell and share your life with us. Sally writes, thank you so much for sharing your incredible personal journey, uh, personal story with us. Your courage, determination, emotional strength, and commitment are so inspiring. I'm looking forward to reading your memoir and um, learning from your example. And we have hit eight o'clock. Uh, so Mazas, uh, I think you've sort of, certain kind of already given your, uh, your your last words a couple of times, but is there is there anything else you'd like to see, say to the audience uh, before we wrap up? Uh, yes, I think uh, first of all, I want to say once again, you know, thank you so much for for giving me this opportunity to um, you know to talk about my book, and uh, thank you so much for attending for your kind words. And um, what I always wanted to uh, uh, you know mention is that uh, do not kind of forget the power of a personal history, uh, your history of the past, the the, the past of a pain, and it gives us two things. One. Um, we know what to avoid doing. Second, we develop in a world drive and a tenacity to carry out what we do. And I hope that we can hold on to the power of the personal history that defines who we are, influences our behaviors and attitudes, and it gives us the tenacity to create a sustainable value in the world. And I hope that wherever you are, you are creating a sustainable value in the world. And once again, I thank you so much for attending. 
Great. Thank you so much, Mazash. Uh, thank you all uh, so much for tuning in. Look for that email tomorrow with the recording, the feedback survey, and information about some other virtual uh, programs coming up. So thank you all, and I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their evening. Have a good night. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.